Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this year's local government session as part of the 2020 New Zealand ESRI Users Conference. My name is Nick Duke, GIS Account Manager at Eagle Technology, and I'm going to be one of your MCs today. I'm also joined by my colleague Julian Pilua, who's a GIS consultant in the Technical Solutions team. Kia ora, everyone. As for today's agenda, we have an action packed afternoon planned for you including a technology update from Julian, a presentation from our session sponsor, NearMap, followed by community updates from councils around the country. And to close it out, a QA and a to give you the opportunity to ask us and our presenters any questions you may have. Now, in terms of those questions, with the, with the NZEUC 2020 digital platform, you should find Q&A panel on the bottom left of your screen. You may have used it already today. If you click this and select the local government as the session, your questions will then be passed on to us. Please feel free to ask us questions throughout the presentation and we'll do our best to address them in the Q&A at the end. And if we run out of time, we'll address those post-conference. And without further ado, let's kick off the session with a video from our session sponsor, Nearman. A lot can happen in just a few months. Here's the thriving cosmopolitan city of Auckland in December of 2019. And here it is in May, smack bang in the time of COVID-19. You can see the docks are empty. Most of the streets too. This is New Zealand doing the right thing and Kiwis staying home during the pandemic. And what this picture really tells you, however, is that no matter what challenges face our communities, we can still manage, plan and respond, and we can do it all safely with Nearmap. We're the company that flies over more New Zealand cities and towns more often than anyone else to bring you a reliable virtual way to stay on top of it all. We're powered by industry leading geospatial mapping technology. Our patented camera systems and processing software is world class. We capture large areas in glorious detail and it's all processed fast, not months, not weeks, just a few days, max. And we capture your area at least twice a year. That's much more frequent than the free public stuff, and that's good news for fast-growing communities. Here's Grafton, the highest growth suburb in Auckland in 2018, and its neighbour Newton, another development hotspot. Across the port, we have Takapuna, with Nearmap, you can see new developments, changes in traffic, infrastructure, construction, the state of your assets. You can even view change over time instantly with all our historic content right at your fingertips. Let's take a look at the CBD. Then and now. It's easy to see and compare when construction begins. 
and voila, is almost complete. Planning for population growth? Well, here we're looking for a space that might suit a wharf. How much room is there? How might we divert traffic while we're at it? Our high resolution aerial imagery is not just beautiful, it's got the detail you need to inspect, measure, monitor and plan right from your desk, wherever that might be. This is ideal for tasks like asset management where you can instantly take a look at the conditions of your infrastructure right down to the lane markings on your roads. You might need some more paint on that. You can look it all up from your browser or via an API integration that puts the imagery you need right into the heart of your in-house or industry standard GIS platforms. So why muck about if the stuff is out of date or inconsistent? Nearmap has your area already covered and ready to go. For city's sake, take a look today. Isn't it fascinating to see just how much our cities have changed in the last six months, um, particularly when looking from above. So just want to reiterate some of those key figures that were shown in the video there. Um, so NearMap currently ca uh, captures urban imagery across 14 um, locations in New Zealand, uh, once or twice annually, as shown on the map on the left there, and at a six centimetre resolution or better. And this imagery is designed to supplement your existing regional imagery captures for those projects uh, which require regular monitoring or perhaps um, change detection. Uh, so if NearMap imagery is something that interests you, please do get in touch with your uh, account manager or feel free to send us a message at the end of the session there. Thanks, Julia. Now I believe it's time you uh, give us an ArcGIS technology update. That I am, and I'm also going to uh, change my shirt and haircut in the process. <laughs> Clever you. Cheers, Nick. So for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to be giving you a quick fire update on ArcGIS technology relating to the local government sector. And to get us started, I'd like to talk a bit about ArcGIS Hub. ArcGIS Hub is a cloud-based engagement platform that enables you to work more effectively with your community. Hub achieves this by aligning your ArcGIS Online content, users and groups to work towards a targeted data-driven initiative, whether that be preserving freshwater ecosystems or perhaps requesting feedback on placemaking proposals. And the output is a familiar website interface. Now, many of you are already utilizing ArcGIS Hub in a public or internal capacity, whether that be for the purpose of open data sharing, community engagement, or perhaps as the front end to your self-service GIS capabilities. And here are a few examples uh, worth checking out, each of which addressing uh, these three categories, New Plymouth and Rangatike District Council's GeoHubs, and Nelson City Council and Tasman District Council's Joint Future Development Strategy Hub. Keep up the great work, guys. So ArcGIS Hub Basic is readily available to you as part of your ArcGIS Alarm subscription. However, you can take Hub one step further what if you could assign an identity to engage members of the public and enlist them as a trusted crowdsourcer? Well, you can. ArcGIS Hub has a premium module which allows you to empower your community by providing them with an identity and the technology that they need to help inform data-driven decisions. And this information can natively feed into your organization's single source of truth. To do so, you're gonna need a workforce. So you're provided with 100 creator named users, essentially giving your community the ability to create, edit, and view their own uh, maps, apps, and layers, and best of all, access the Esri field apps. These users then live in a secondary ArcGIS Online organization, which is connected to your existing org via a one-way window, allowing you to collaborate with your community members, yet preventing them from seeing your secure information. And you also gain access to a variety of administrative tools for site building, event management, analytics, and more. So where have we seen value in the solution? Well, so far we've seen Hub Premium being used as a multi-organizational uh, collaboration platform, empowering council staff, stakeholders, and community groups to work towards data-driven initiatives, whether it be reforestation or biosecurity, theme is common, using the power of geospatial to make better informed decisions. And from one solution onto another, ArcGIS solutions. 
Now, these have been around for a long time and have rightfully been overlooked. However, as of last month, there are dozens of new solutions leveraging the latest capabilities of the ArcGIS platform, which is certainly worth checking out. And many of these actually include ArcGIS Hub to house the solution. Along with these new templates, there's also a new deployment tool allowing you to get started directly within ArcGIS Align. So you no longer have to um, download files and uh, install it via that. It's really available to you. So if you navigate to ArcGIS Align, you can see I've got a little banner at the top there. Click the app launcher at the top of your screen. If you select solutions, and then select your desired solution. So you can have a browse through there and see if there are any which catch your eye. And one of the solutions I'd like to draw on in particular um, today is the 3D base map solution, which has seen a number of improvements. The tool now allows you to get, um, oh, one more slide. The tool now allows you to get more value out of your regional LiDAR by not only deriving 3D buildings and trees, but also bridges, power lines, and with the correct ingredients, building floors and underground pipes. A question we often hear is that, well, 3D is cool and all, but how can it add value to our organization? Well, after today's plenary, I hope you no longer have that question, but just in case you do, the 3D base map solution is one of the stepping stones to implement ArcGIS Urban, helping you to improve and visualize planning processes in your city. You can provide digital context to the inherently 3D world we live in, or you can con conduct analysis, whether that be view shared, shadow, acoustic, or um, as shown in the bottom right, flood impact analysis. But to summarize, definitely check out the free new solutions tailored to local government. The third solution I'd like to update you on today is local maps, which has been featured all throughout this morning's plenary. Many of you out there will be uh, local maps users already, but for those of you who may have joined us recently, local maps is a web-based self-service GI solution, which provides a front-facing interface for your portal content. It extends the capabilities of your existing web maps through smart widgets and provides you with the tools to connect your spatial and aspatial data, whether that be living in a SQL database or perhaps it's a RAM uh, service. Um, local maps has tools to, to to help you with that process. Uh, local Maps was developed by Eagle in a response to the, the demands of uh, councils such as yourselves. And we're currently sitting on version 2.3. So it's a mature product that's been around for a while. In terms of what's new and what's coming um, in the immediate future, we have a quality patch coming out on September 28th, which includes functionality such as arcade support for pop-ups, automatic logins, and a vast number of improvements and bug fixes uh, submitted by users such as yourselves. Supplementing that, we've also been working um, with a number of you and internal staff and technical advisors to produce some best practice and FAQ documentation around things such as map configuration, service publishing, report building, geoprocessing services, and more. So keep an eye out for that in our Confluence documentation. Uh, as I mentioned before, local maps functionality is driven based on your valuable feedback. So we're looking at new ways to directly integrate your feedback into our DevOps planner. So a survey one, two, three form will be coming to our GeoNet community soon, which we've been uh, using internally, which we've been finding really uh, successful. Um, and as you saw on the road ahead this morning, development of our um, re-architected version of local maps, version 3.0 is um, underway. So we'll be asking each of you uh, for your feedback on what you currently value in the product and what improvements you'd like to see, um, how you'd like local maps to look and feel, uh, if there's any functionality that you'd find uh, really valuable and you know others would too, um, we'd really like to hear it. So we'll be in touch um, in terms of getting your feedback. And last but not least, to close it off, I'd like to mention the shared services which are available to you all. So strength is in numbers. So if you and your neighboring councils would like to team up on on-premise trainings, collaborative platforms like ArcGIS Online, ArcGIS Hub, or local maps like we mentioned today, or perhaps engage in a GIS managed service to relieve the stress of your internal IT and GIS teams, um, these are all options to you. So feel free to reach out to your designated account manager um, but anywho, that is all from me from the tech update. Hope you found that useful. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy our insightful community updates from around the country. Back to you, Nick.
Thanks, Julian. This year definitely seems to be the year of the hub, sites popping up all over the place. So we look forward to seeing what you will come up with, with initiatives and community engagement. Now I'd like to transition over to our community updates from around the country. We're very fortunate to have five pre presentations for you this afternoon, ranging from Auckland to Christchurch. And starting from near the top of the country, Auckland, I'd like to pass over to Greg and Carl. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Greg Price, Account Manager at Eagle Technology. For this community update, I'm joined by Carl Alloway, the Solutions and Services Manager at Auckland Council. Thanks for joining us today, Carl. So we've been seeing a trend recently across local government where councils are looking for new ways to enable their enterprise through the use of self-service GIS. Carl, it'd be awesome if you can tell us how Auckland Council are going about this. Thanks, Greg. So I'm here to just give a little update on something that we are tentatively calling GeoHub. So um, self-service GIS at Auckland Council isn't necessarily a particularly new thing. Uh, for quite a long time, we've offered self-serve GIS solutions. Um, I guess traditionally that's been through the use of desktop tools where people inside our organization can get hold of licenses and carry out you know the, the range of activities that you can use uh, ArcGIS uh, desktop products like ArcMap and ArcGIS Pro for. Uh, a number of years ago, before we had GeoMaps, we had legacy GIS viewers from the previous uh, councils that existed before Auckland Council. And now we have GeoMaps, which is also a form of uh, self-service GIS. Um, it's a slightly different type of self-service GIS to the desktop products. It has a specific range of capability and functionality but essentially it allows people to use um, a piece of technology and all of the data that's associated with that technology to carry out a range of things for, for, their, for their work. And so over the last um, around about year and a half, following the completion of a large enterprise upgrade, uh, where a lot of the very latest ArcGIS technologies become available, it's, it's now in a position where we're, we're in a position now where we can offer uh, better or more self-service GIS capability to our business. So we've had it in mind for quite a while now to look to utilize the power of, of portal specifically and really maximize uh, the investment that we've made in, in the technology to um, be used by our business. So from a, a really high level perspective, GeoHub, and I'll talk about that obviously in a little bit more in a minute, uh, the high level purpose of GeoHub is to further enable Auckland Council GIS users to carry out mapping analysis and visualization tasks for themselves, this time in a web enabled setting, which desktop isn't, GeoMaps is to a degree, but this is going a step beyond this. And the little slogan we've got there is um, self-service GIS beyond the, test, beyond the desktop. Uh, and so what is GeoHub at a really high level? It's a sandbox self-serve GIS product with capability to use the latest ArcGIS technology um, and use that technology with the authoritative Auckland Council content that we have in a safe and secure environment. I'll come on to what GeoHub is in a, a little bit more detail in a second, but I just think it's worth just having a, a quick consideration around things that uh, I think are the responsibility of the, the geospatial team at Auckland Council. So the capability and the power of GeoHub and the technologies that we have today are really stretching the limit and really making us think about where there are boundaries, if there are to be boundaries between our GIS users and our business and the geospatial team itself. Um, so we've created a, a product here, but what we are really not looking to do is to really outsource any of the core accountabilities that we have as a geospatial team. And so for the use of GeoHub, there are a couple of, I think, things that we're saying that if you're looking to do something that might um, come into consideration with these things, then you might want to have a conversation with the geospatial team. We're not just throwing this out there and, and saying to the, to the customers that good luck with using this. We want this to be an ongoing conversation. We've changed the way that we're approaching our business customers. So we see that much more as a collaborative relationship, but certainly more so than ever in the past. And so we expect there to be you know, open dialogue when people are using this product. 
Um, but if there's something that they're looking to do that contains corporate or authoritative data, where there's information that needs to be shared across the organization, be stored in particular ways, or information that needs to be shared with the public, has particularly high value or there's some kind of risk associated with that, we're saying that that's probably a conversation that we want to have with uh, that person trying to create that, say, solution, and that we might decide actually that GeoHub is not the best place for that to be done. That's okay. Um, there are many ways for us to get the, the outcomes that they would, the customers would be looking for. And that's the case for these other things as well. So if there's something uh, as a solution that needs to be well supported, used in an operational way where change management, reliability, security, or the, the expectations of the actual end user are, are exceptionally high, then also we'd be saying, well, is GeoHub the best place for that to be sitting? If there's a need for any type of integration or for that solution to be shared to the organization or in fact to the public where the type of demand is going to be a potential risk for our system resources, then we're also saying that GeoHub may not be the best place for that. But otherwise, I think that if we now take a look at the, the capabilities of what GeoHub is, and really when we talk about the capability of GeoHub, we're really talking about what's the capability of Portal for ArcGIS, then the possibilities are literally kind of endless. And why we call it a sandbox is because there's not one thing that we're saying that you can do with this. There's just a huge range of activities that you can use um, this capability for. So what is GeoHub? It's built on our existing ArcGIS Enterprise on-premise platform. Specifically, it utilizes Portal for ArcGIS and ArcGIS Data Store. And I guess the configuration of this as a product includes two very specific things that we've been working on um, for a little while now. So one part of that are the user roles. And these are custom roles that we've created and they are uh, in order of, I guess, the amount of capability that they are given in these roles, so the SME, analyst, editor, and viewer. The SME really is um, a geospatial champion. They have the ability to do uh, all of the content creation and sharing, whereas the analyst has the ability to do some of that. The editor is simply a person that would be able to edit data, and a viewer is a person that is able just to view the content largely that that SME would then have created. The groups that go alongside um, the user roles are department specific. So the idea is that we would, way, that the way we've, we've created this so far is that we would see a single SME or a number of SMEs that would sit in one of our departments of our business. And we've got lots and lots and lots of different departments. Um, and they essentially would provide a level of geospatial service to that department using this GeoHub capability. And to do that, they would need some groups set up to be able to share that content with those people. And that's one of the key parts of the SME user role is that they can not only create and view content, but they can also share it with those groups. So the user groups generally would consist of a collaboration group. And that's a group that we see as one being kind of like a, kind of like a development environment for those SMEs where they can create and play with the capabilities of GeoHub without having to release that to a group that people then could actually see that information. So the idea being that they could collaborate as a team of SMEs in that group and then release it to one of the other groups that they have underneath their banner. So the department group would be a group that spans the entirety of a, a business department. Um, we've been working with our Healthy Waters and our community facilities groups throughout the course of the last couple of months in order to get this to a point where we're at a Kind of a starting point with the rollout of GeoHub, uh, and these department, uh, these groups made a lot of sense for them. But we are obviously constantly going to be reviewing capability of GeoHub, um, and the department group, for example, for community facilities, would cover a, a couple of hundred people. And so everybody in their whole department would be at least a viewer. There might be some editors, there might be some analysts, and there'll be a couple of SMEs who would then release that content to that group. In addition to the, the collaboration and departmental group, there would also be a sensitive group or a classified group or um, protected group, however you want to describe that. So that would be a, a subset of people from that department group that there might be a need to share some types of data with that's not for the rest of the department to view. So it's more of a, a sensitive information department. 
that's kind of the configuration that we have for I guess GeoHub and some simple terms there. Uh, from a capability perspective, um, you know, you've got the full weight of portal for ArcGIS pretty much is and an ArcGIS data store. So you can store data, you can publish hosted services, you can create web maps, you obviously can edit data that exists in there. You can use Web App Builder, you can use all of the template applications, um, you have access to all of the field apps, the dashboards, story maps, everything that exists in the portal, which is extremely extensive these days. You obviously would have access to, access to all of the authoritative AC content, so all of the data that we have, as well as the base, base maps that we have, as well as the ability to pull into um, GeoHub any non-AC authoritative content from, from, from the web. You can carry out analysis and geoprocessing in this environment, although saying that our expectation is that you know, the SMEs themselves are likely still to have ArcGIS desktop products. So if they're really doing any heavy lifting that they probably still want to use those products, so this is just a complementary product alongside that. And they're able to share the content with the group. So you know, again, what we're seeing or expecting from this is that mapping and analysis that would usually have been done on desktop and then had to have been printed or would then have had to have been given to us first to then publish and share through something like Geomax in the past is now going to be, all be done by these users themselves within their business unit. So the key thing is there is being able to share this within that web enabled setting. What I talked a bit a little bit about earlier on was around um, the ability for people to produce things where there might be something that needs to go to the public or needs to go to the organization or is containing authoritative or sensitive data or if it's something or a ongoing business operational use. What we're saying in those cases, let's have a conversation about it. And if the determination is that GeoHub is not the best place to do that, then, for example, if the outcome is still going to be something very similar to a Survey123 form, well, the great thing is, is that GeoHub would allow customers to still create that Survey123 form as a proof of concept and simply hand that to the geospatial team to then review and implement in what is otherwise our geospatial platform. So instead of starting from a blank piece of paper on day one of a project where we ask, you know, go through the whole requirements gathering process, which takes a long time and costs more money, we can have pretty much a ready-made proof of concept that we can use as essentially uh, a, a really strong requirements package to then take forward. Theory being that it will save us a huge amount of upfront work to understand what exactly it is that we need to do. So uh, huge benefit there. So GeoHub is a product that's kind of come together fairly slowly over the last 18 months or so. Um, we are really, I guess, at a point where we're ready to start rolling this out to the business proper now. GeoHub itself is a work in progress name. Um, but already we're thinking about, okay, so now we have a, a day one ready product here. What is it that we want to look to improve in the future? So to us obviously we want to roll this out to wider than the two kind of guinea pig business plants that we've been using over the last few months to try and finalize where we are today um, and the potential for rolling this out across our organization is ginormous um, we can't do that all in one big huge step um, and I think that we'll still be talking to the business about you know whether they want to do this we've got people that are you know been screaming at us for years to do this, whereas other departments we haven't really worked with very closely because they don't realize what GIS could do for them yet. We haven't been actively um, seeking those people out just yet, but the opportunity to do so is ginormous. Obviously, there's, there's no cost barrier in this, so there's no cost to the business for using this. So there's really very little barriers stopping people from at least trying it. And if they don't like it, then are they crazy? Um, uh, and if they do do like it, then there's nothing stopping them from rolling it out across the whole of their department. So, um, yeah, obviously we'll we'll see a probably a, a an initial rollout from our the teams or the or the departments that we work with frequently and have been clamoring for this, and then we'll start being able to actually target parts of the business of which there are many that we haven't even started to talk to yet about this or about geospatial capability at all. Um, so that is going to be a long ongoing process. We will continue to review the roles and the 
capabilities of what those roles can do. Um, the same as the groups, we, we already know that some of the, from some of the conversations we've had with people that we have rolled it out to that the kind of group structure that we've come up with largely works, but there's, there are scenarios that it, that it doesn't quite work. So we'll be constantly reviewing how we shape up the groups that go alongside GeoHub. We know that um, there's at least a couple of our business departments that are interested in looking at 3D capability in Portal. We actually haven't enabled that. Uh, at this moment of time, and for reasons off, we need to put a time to investigate what the impact might be to our platform before enabling that. But our intention is to deploy the 3D capability as well. We haven't enabled the hosted tile service, or yeah, the hosted tile services either, and that's something that we'll obviously look to do as well in future. Um, we it's a little bit difficult at the moment to access non-AC content. We want to improve. The ability for people to more easily access non AC content. We want to uh, continue to improve any AC content that people would use. For a very long time, um, we've not really made any great updates to uh, our base map and any of the core fundamental data sets that the geospatial team take responsibility for at Open Council. So we want to, um, alongside GeoHub, improve those pieces of content, as well as metadata. So metadata is uh, something that we obviously need to take extremely seriously, and it's something that we need to look at because it's not 100% perfect at the time. Uh, and I guess in addition to actually ro rolling out the actual product itself, um, things that go alongside that include a huge amount of governance and documentation, um, training, information, advice, and so it's getting everybody in the geospatial team up to speed with what all that means, as well as documenting a lot of that so it's ready for customers to use. So that's where we are today with uh, GeoHub, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to tell everybody a little bit more about it, maybe in a year's time, and see where we've got to. Thank you. Thanks for that, Carl. Um, it's great to hear our Organ Council are developing their self-service GIS capabilities and hopefully we'll get an update um, from you this time next year at the 2021 um, New Zealand ESRI User Conference. For our second community update of the day, I'd now like to pass over to a conversation which Nick had with Chris Martin from uh, Hamilton City Council about the GIS business engagement strategy. Over to you guys. Well, hi everyone, I'm Nick Jerk, Account Manager at Eagle Technology uh, and uh, I'm joined by Chris Martin, Chief Data Officer from Hamilton City Council. Chris, thanks for joining us. Um, Chris, you've recently been uh, engaged in a business engagement uh, program at Hamilton City Council. Um, I wonder if you could give us uh, an overview on the intent of that. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, so what we're really trying to do is understand what our business problems and priorities are that, that we think GIS can help. Um, we have about sort of 28 uh, separate business units. They're quite um, disparate in what they do. Um, and to varying degrees, they will either understand or uh, uh, a little bit or or a lot about GIS and how that can help. So we thought um, we'll we'll do a bit of a road show uh, with the business. We'll invite them uh, all to uh, some face-to-face -face sessions, um, and we'll understand what they know about GIS and what they how they think that could help them, and we'll get them to talk to us about what sort of business problems they face. Um, and then hopefully out of that, we can sort of have a bit of a conversation around uh, how we think uh, GIS can help them enable their business. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Chris, so how did you go about engaging with the business? Um, so the first thing uh, we did, Nick, was we, we sort of reached out through our internal comms um, and we put a few sort of messages in our in our sort of daily mail, which is like a, um, a bit of a newsletter that goes around the organisation. Um, and we said, you know, this is what we're doing. Uh, if you're if you're keen, um, book a book a chat with us. Um, and then we also sort of went direct to people that we knew in the business and we 
uh, we gave them a call and invited them to a meeting and we were very fortunate to get a pretty good turnout with that. Um, we, given the fact that sort of some people are remote at the moment, um, not everybody's on site, we booked rooms and then we uh, booked the sessions also into Skype or Zoom or something like that. And uh, between our GIS team and the team at Eagle, uh, we uh, we all sort of collaborated either face to face or online. Um, ran through a reasonably uh, informal session. There was there was a um, a bit of a light scripting to it, but um, predominantly it was a free flowing discussion, trying to understand each part of the business. Um, and we had um, uh, a business analyst from Eagle sort of recording everything that was uh, being said um, and. Uh, putting that together into some form of document for us so we can we can analyze it at a later stage. Mm -hmm. Okay and what's the ultimate sort of output? What, what benefit do you think you're going to gain from the engagement process? Yeah well um, what we really want to uh, do given that we're sort of rolling into a 10-year plan um, we're looking to develop a long-term prioritized program of work with an attached workforce plan that's uh, that's got some resourcing capability lined up against it. So we want to really try and move away from being reactive uh, as much as we can with some of these larger investments. Um, and we think that's probably a better way to go if we are going to really leverage the power that GIS has um, <clears throat> and try and embed some of those um, those sort of transformational capabilities and in, into the various business units. So we'll we'll take that work that we uh, have those conversations that we've recorded, and we'll we'll really try and prioritise those, put, push them into a program of work. As I say, understand what we're going to need to do to deliver it in terms of resourcing, and then we can work with with um, with Eagle to see if uh, how they can help us on that side as well. Thanks, Chris. And, and any um, any sort of prioritised project, any big projects that you think have dropped out of this that that have really um, come to the forefront so far? Uh, yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, there's there's been a few major themes with the business. Um, so a lot of business uh, areas hold information about the the activities that they're doing, uh, but they none of that's very spatial. So there's a real big theme around trying to spatialize uh, everyone's operations. So w where assets are, where activities are taking place, where investments are taking place over time, um, and those sorts of things. So I think being able to sort of um, basically understand what is going on within the city, um, taking all of that really good information that the business has got, and being able to sort of pull it into a into uh, a way that people can easily digest that and see what's happening. Um, that's one of the key themes um, and that's probably one of the first things we'll be working on. Okay, Chris, we'll really appreciate your time today. It's Chris Martin from Hamilton City Council. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers for that, Nick and Chris, for that um, quick fire conversation. Uh, it was great to hear, uh, Chris, how you're able to engage with the business, even uh, despite our challenges with people working from home and, and whatnot with COVID at the moment. Um, but we look forward to seeing what uh, Hamilton City Council, um, how they sort of take that spatial approach to business problems in the future. Um, so we'll um, look forward to seeing what comes out of there. For our third community update of today comes from James Gunn, a true geospatial uh, champion at Christchurch City Council. And his job title actually reflects this also. I think we're, we're all pretty uh, jealous of that job title. And we'll have to add it to the endless list of spatial job descriptions. But without further ado, um, over to you, James. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's James Gunn and I'm from the Christchurch City Council. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what's going on in our area uh, right now and also what kind of led to um, led to why we're doing what we're doing right now. Um, the focus of my talk really is going to be less about GIS specifically and really about how our organization is evolving and how we have to adapt and fit within that so we can continue to 
leverage and, and deliver value uh, to our wider organization and our citizens. There's four uh, main areas that I'm gonna talk about this morning, or this afternoon, sorry. The first one is our organizational digital strategy. That's a organization strategy, not just the IT strategy. And it's got some very wide ranging and long ranging goals for the Christchurch city um, organization. And it's really important that spatial fits within that and enable some of that. The next aspect of that is uh, we've had a pretty large scale reorganization of our IT unit with the digital strategy at the forefront of it. So the team itself needed to change its structure. Thirdly, within spatial and within a broader sort of business intelligence um, area, we're continuing to evolve how we do our work. So I'm gonna to talk to you a lot about Agile and specifically how we've implemented it, a version of Scrum, and how we're trying to enable streams of work um, targeted at continuous platform enhancements, but also specific business solutions. And last but not least, um, some of you may be aware that Christchurch City Council has traditionally been a hexagon geomedia um, organization. And we're moving away from that and more into the ESRI enterprise world. Um, and with it comes a very large scale technical transition that we have to be very careful about how we do it because it's going to take a very long time and we can't afford to do it all in one big go. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit technically about how, how that's happening. So I appreciate you can't read all the words there, but the, the gist of the strategy focuses on three um, high level areas. The first one is, um, and this is kind of at the forefront of the organization and where it's at, is to focus on the citizen. So we're thinking about a digital citizen experience that's essentially going to lead all the things that we do internally um, that have anything to do with technology and, and it's really about putting the citizen at at the front of everything um, the next sort of aspect on the lower right the pink area is, is is enabling our people so that's an internally focused area where we're trying to enable frontline staff so you might hear phrases that are merging um, in the technical sector or it sector around faster time to action or faster time to decision making. So that's really about how we can get the right tools and the right information to the right people, and then they can make decisions and actions and feed that through. Um, and then the third area is to constantly be focusing on delivering value. So what is the impact we are trying to create and, and focus on that rather than just doing lots of work and continuing to do work Our IT structure itself, um, we used to have a very service based approach. So council has six large groups of business that it does. Um, and we had essentially mirrored that structure in our IT unit where um, each team within the IT department focused on delivering a service to a particular group of the business. Um, and so some of you can probably already re rationalize that that essentially created silos that didn't work very well together. Each business group in the council would jostle over the same amount of IT funding to get what it wanted. Um, the new structure focusing on enabling a digital platform or digital platforms and our digital strategy is recognized that actually joined up solutions is, is really obvious, even though um, it wasn't so obvious to us um, before the, that. So the new teams um, that you can see on the screen there, I'll read them out from the left to right. So we've got our program and planning team. So they help us make sure that we're spending rate payer money and, and, lend, and borrowing money and we're spending it in the right way so we can demonstrate that investment case. Um, we have a digital solution team which sits across all the other service teams. And the idea with that team is they broker the majority of the interactions with the entire wider business. Not everything has to go through them, but they have a lot of business partners, business analysts, solutions architects. Um, and the idea is that they look at holistic joined up problems and how to solve them. We have a digital assurance team. So that's around how we internally operate and deliver. Um, it also includes a test and quality control aspect. 
So um, they link in quite tightly with our program and planning team just to make sure that we're doing things the right way. Um, whereas the digital solutions team are really focused around making sure that we're doing the right things. And then the, now, uh, the next three teams are probably the, the working horse of the IT or digital um, platforms. So we have service operations, which are the ongoing systems and major sort of interactions that are in place. So we have our IT service desk or help desk. We have library systems. We have a digital workplace team. So they look after computers and um, laptops and so forth. We have a digital library. We have the network team and the cloud architecture spaces in there. So that's really about keeping things humming um, and the infrastructure humming. Then there's the digital platforms area which sits under what's called the CTO. And these are the major systems we have. So that's, in, in our case, that's SAP. We have an integrational ecosystem hub called MuleSoft. We have specific but very large systems that are targeted at specific business areas. So we might have um, Intelli Leisure for our rec and sport bookings. And uh, we have Pathway, which is our consenting and compliance and regulatory function. So there's a lot of systems that are big, but only used by particular business areas. So that's, it's under digital platform. And we have a customer experience team. That's our, essentially our website. And then last but not least, and this is where the GIS team sits, is in a, in a wider group called information management, where although we look after systems, uh, the systems tend to include data that spans multiple other systems and is optimized and formatted in a way to generate the best insight. So I've highlighted the spatial BI and data man management teams. That's essentially a business intelligence. Um, and, um, and the idea with information management is that we are here to work with the digital solutions team and the platform teams to make sure that information is flowing nicely and um, we can help create joined up answers for people um, to get them what they need. It also is the area where we hold the Records Compliance Act and the Privacy Act. So we have to make sure that we are doing data classification and data security and so forth. Um, so that's quite a big change for us because there's, there's actually quite a lot of overlap in the responsibility for each of these areas. And I think that's quite deliberate. It's important that if you, have um, vertical, you know, I like to call them silos, but you can't avoid silos. And the, and the point is that you actually need to make your silos work together. And I think it's really, um, it's, it's a really good thing to see that our areas have overlapped because it's forcing us to work together instead of being able to get on and deliver a solution on our own for our own direct customer. We want to, we really want to drill home that joined up approach um, and, and holistic delivery. In terms of um, segue into how we are conceptualizing and improving the way that we work and how we wrangle funding, there's essentially two sort of broader ways to describe our, our work stream. So there's the core and plat core platform investment streams, and that's down the bottom there, which tend to be quite large projects that span years, uh, and you have to go through a large investment case but you really need to keep those projects humming along. You know, that's where you bring in new systems or do major upgrades or major architectural changes. So, so our transition from Hexagon to Esri is one of these investment streams. And as you go through that roadmap, you will enable functions and capabilities that then allow you to do more agile um, and iterative based solution development. So that's where we've got what we call a bundle or you know, continuous improvement and um, blends in with what other people might call business as usual, where we work with specific needs um, and we solve those problems in an iterative and agile fashion. That's, um, that's quite a big shift from what we used to do, which was just project by project, um, project start, project end, deliver, and then just a raft of service requests that come in through a BAU um, sense and you just kind of pick them off from top to bottom. Um, so in terms of our platform delivery, we're leveraging a lot of content in the Agile Scrum and Less Works kind of framework. If you're, if you're familiar with um, less.works, it's a great website that kind of shows you a bit about how large scale Scrum can fit in. Um, my role within this is as a product owner and a product manager. So I work to understand the priorities and the needs and then uh, make sure that the team understands what those are on a fortnightly basis. And then we can work to deliver those 
our teams transitioned from like a continuous delivery or Kanban type view to two week sprints. Um, and every two weeks, we're actually quite continually, we're making sure that what we're delivering in those two weeks are the most important things. Sometimes it's about recognizing that something urgent has cropped up. Um, other times it's about making sure that if we don't finish a certain thing this fortnight, then um, there are going to be longer term impacts, and longer term delays and dependencies. So it's really um, twofold in that we're trying to change the way that we look at how we do work, but also change how the organization gets work done by us. So previously, um, it was just ask for something and wait and you got it. Whereas now we can actually start to um, collaborate and plan when we do what we do by a, um, doing less reactive stuff. Um, so the reason we chose Scrum and a two week sprint is that we wanted to favor responsiveness and flexibility because there are a lot of things that come in short notice that we have not necessarily a huge amount of control over. I mean, the city council is a political organization, so priorities come and go and they change around to an extent. So we want to be able to minimize the disruption of that. It used to be a top priority came in and it was all hands on deck and that was hugely disruptive. So now we've, we've been able to uh, um, mitigate the impact of, of reactive work while also being able to um, continue to invest in our strategic platform objectives and also deliver some of those specific business solutions that might take several weeks to do um, and, and still meet the expectations of delivery dates. Um, and last but not least, we're, we're continuing to find opportunities to make enhancements to the platform. So if there's a use case that doesn't exist um, in the technology yet, but a particular business area wants it, and we can see a wider application for that, then we'll try and favor trying to solve those earlier so that more business units can leverage some of that functionality that we've, we've newly implemented. Um, we're also trying to upskill the wider organization how to use GIS tools. So getting the right tools, empowering our users. Um, we used to just be considered a back office team that would do all the GIS work. And, and we've, we've been able to get the agreement from the organization that that's not sustainable because you can't just keep growing your GIS team if you want more GIS. You actually just need to grow that capability within the wider organization. So you need people that know how to use GIS tools. doesn't mean they have to be GIS professionals, but they need to learn at the right level and use the right complexity of tools. And so we're doing a lot of coaching, um, which I think is really great. We're spending less time doing the doing than we've ever had before. We're doing a lot of coaching and we're doing a lot of back end setup, um, which I think is really where that platform delivery approach is going to take us. Um, in order for us to have gotten where we've gotten to in the last few years, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Um, we've been trying, trying to go agile for two years um, and you can't, you really can't succeed without measuring. You know, one of the key um, tenets of the Agile Manifesto is, is to measure and learn and have this uh, philosophy of relentless improvement. So we've got dashboards over the top of DevOps, which is where we put all of our work, manage all of our work delivery. Um, so I've got a close eye to that and I work very closely with the team leaders and our scrum masters to make sure that the team is understanding why it's important to break stories down and size them properly, finish them at the sprint rather than carrying them on and on and on. So there's a lot of metrics that are open for anyone to look at. We've got a more detailed view for our operational weekly planning and weekly standups. Um, and so, yeah, there's some really, really good metrics in there that help me get a feel for whether the team is struggling on some work, whether um, some things might start to slip. So it just gives us those early warning signs um, because yeah, you can't, you can't ma manage something that easily if you're not measuring it. And it's, it's really hard to learn if you're not able to see where things aren't quite going right. So some of the technical stuff that's going on in our area. So we've just upgraded ArcGIS 10.8. We've still got Hexagon Geomedia in there. Um, we sit on top of a Microsoft SQL Server. We've got you know 900 layers, 1500 views that combine more tables together to present some layers. Um, we have hundreds, maybe even thousands of stored procedures and triggers. So we do a lot of our smarts and our automation at the SQL Server level, um, just because that's just the way that we prefer to implement a lot of our development. Um, and one of the key bits of work for us to move off Hexagon is to move away from the Hexagon 
in geomedia proprietary geometry and use a SQL Server geometry, which Esri reads quite nicely. Um, we can't just turn off the geometry though, unfortunately. We have a lot of stuff that's baked into that. So we're trying to do um, a bit of a smart in place upgrade where we make some back end changes to the tables and all of our hexagon stuff continues to work where and our Esri stuff can also continue to work. Um, in order for us to also migrate off hexagon, we actually need to rebuild all of those database views and store procedures in a new database. Um, there are some things that Esri prefers the format of the data to be in. So we're prototyping building some new layers in the Esri world and making sure that they're backwards compatible to be read only in the hexagon world while we slowly transition everything before we can really transition all the end user tools. We think it's gonna be about a two year stretch target to decouple all of these dependencies. Um, and we're focusing on trying to decouple the dependencies with the fewest downstream aspects. So um, our GeoMedia viewer is called Smart Client. If we can swap a whole lot of things out and make all the tables read only, then we can get rid of Smart Client. So there's a bit of a tactical roadmap there to kind of work out how quickly we can get off some of these tools. Um, while at the same time, because you might say we're well, transitioning the back end stuff is actually going to deliver relatively little value. We might save license cost and be able to focus more of our time. But at the same time we're transitioning, we're also implementing and enabling new Esri features that Hexagon just doesn't have. So a lot of 3D stuff, um, mobile app, you know, seamless online, offline editing, um, some of the smarts around the topology and the utility network. So we want to look at how we can migrate these features while at the same time enabling more advanced Esri GIS capabilities. So a couple of examples that I've got here of um, some interesting work, um, hopefully they'll be able to load up on screen, um, is one of our first 3D maps. So this is on our public website and it's designed to um, attract and also display to people who may invest in our city, um, invest in the land, who, who don't necessarily know Christchurch very well. So this highlights key sites or what we're calling our places. Um, and then the green, green and blue shades are essentially development opportunities. So um, there's large areas of, it's not quite vacant land, but they are properties that essentially are sitting there that don't have a resource or building consent. So nothing's really gonna start on them just yet. So as a developer, you can quite quickly look at this and, um, and you can fire up a line of inquiry. So there's an email us inbox and you can look up the rates and the valuation for that particular property. Um, and some of these slightly lighter green shades are properties that have a pending resource consent, but you know, that might be attractive to a developer that might want to buy a property that has the resource consent already approved, but maybe hasn't got the building consent locked in. So um, it's also an indication that there is activity going on. Uh, there's been a large sort of political concern that post earthquake, the central city is going to have um, a hard time rejuvenating and it needs some attention given to it. So this is one of the tools that we've worked with, with our planners and our urban design team to enable the public to see a bit more about what's going on. Uh, at the same time, it's allowed us to learn a bit more about the back end 3D ESRI functionality and, and how we can you know, automate some of these data objects flowing through. So our next, our next quite successful solution was for our pest plant work, where our field workers um, are constantly out in the field. Uh, they're trying to locate pest plant species, and, and the idea is to eradicate or control these invasive species. Um, I'm not talking about your general weedy, we're talking about um, climbers and trees that will grow and self-seed and completely destroy the local habitat. Uh, and those of you who know Christchurch and Banks Peninsula, there's a lot of hilly and valley terrains and rocky outcrops that have quite rare plant species and also rare lizards and birds um, and insects. And so it doesn't take long for these going unchecked to be um, yeah, essentially completely destroyed. So what we've done with our park team is we've enabled them to uh, track and record all of their plant site infestations, where they essentially draw a polygon to record the fact 
that they know that there is an infestation or a, um, an invasive species in a particular area, they can then attach a control activity that's been performed. So if they go out there and they're doing some weeding or they're doing some spray or they've got a contractor doing some helicopter spray, then they record all of that data against the site. And then what that allows them to visualize year on year is how much activity is going on, which species are able to be controlled, is there a decline in age structure or density? And they can also compare between two different years and within a particular catchment. They can also start answering questions off the cuff in community consultations around how much chemical has been applied, which is quite a sensitive subject. Um, and also over the years, you know, you're thinking over decades here, because it can take up to decades to really get these large scale infestations under control. Um, people want to know how much chemical has been applied, or rather you, we need to be able to demonstrate that we're not applying very much chemical and it's quite effective. So this, this is one of the dashboards that our um, policy planners is, is able to use to inform their annual reporting instead of diving into hundreds of different spreadsheets and, and so forth where they can select a particular species. Uh, this is just using ops dashboard, so it's pretty straightforward out of the box stuff. So a particular species, so this is uh, Spur valerian. Uh, you can select a particular control year, so uh, I'm trying to compare last year with the year before. And what that's showing is that there's been a marked decrease in mixed ages of Spur valerian. So from 53% of sites to 32, and there's a lot less mature down from sorry, an increase from 12 up to 33 and mature, but that's probably because they're categorizing mixed ages differently and getting them a bit more controlled. So um, the ecologists have been extremely pleased with this result and also the operational field staff um, have a lot more information when they do their weekly or monthly planning around where they've been and um, the field staff that they're supervising where they can go next. So some of the next applications in this space that I can see would be to implement workforce and allow the uh, the 12 different park teams to really get more out of their week by by creating kind of task sheets and, and actually demonstrating that they're able to pre-plan a lot of their work. Um, another really useful at, um, aspect of this tool is to show people how little impact um, they can have if they're not given enough money uh, so one of the biggest challenges in this particular parks funding unit is that it's perceived to be funded well enough. And so this is a really powerful tool for the park rangers to be able to demonstrate that of the sites that they've controlled, which is a very small proportion of them, um, they're generating really, really good results. And of the sites that they're not controlling, um, it's actually causing an, an exponential growth and spread of the, of, the, of the species. So it helps that commentary around um, advocacy of funding and resources. Last but not least, one of our strategic priorities as a council is to make natural hazard information more available to the public. So this is really about teaching people more about the hazards that are in the city so they can make better decisions. It's less about putting this information on your property limb and you know devaluing your property. I mean, the hazard's there. And the idea is that a lot of that fear and perception is because people don't understand enough about the hazards. So again, one of our policy writers took on the task of learning how to build story maps and maps in Enterprise Portal. Um, and she did all of this on her own, pretty much. We helped her with the last few things to get it over the line, but um, we're actually all really impressed with this result. And most people thought that it was actually the GIS team that this but this is done by a policy writer so there's a really great introduction on coastal hazards some really old photos you know over the last few decades showing that actually coastal hazards in Christchurch have been around for a long time and they've been causing us grief for a long time um, so it's not something new it's not the council telling people they can't live near the beach um, it's really it's a really empowering piece of information um, and then there's the various different maps that demonstrate the level of flooding and the different hazard scenarios and explains what each scenario means, um, where the modeling was, joined up with the coastal erosion data as well. And then we've got a more advanced sort of traditional web app on there. So this is on our public website, uh, or about to be on our public website. And so this is again, 
something that used to be perceived as very sensitive and you could only get it if you made an official information request is now um, free to access for anyone. Uh, the next tranche of this that recently got released under the ECAN umbrella is the liquid action hazard map. So that's essentially the similar kind of vein. We want to get more of this hazard information out there. And so for me, this is a great success story of how coaching others in the organization has allowed them who are the domain experts to create the products that they want for their stakeholders or the public. And that's it from me. Um, thank you all for listening. I hope that was interesting. It was quite a wide ranging um, talk about what's going on at the city council. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your special interest group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, James. Um, I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone uh, when I say that that was really insightful. And I can see we've got a lot of questions coming in uh, from that too. So uh, hopefully uh, James is able to join us for the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, so thank you very much. Just moving on to our four out of our, our five uh, community updates. And this one's just another brief uh, conversation between uh, Nick and this time Ellen Rochek from uh, Topol District Council. And uh, they're gonna be having a bit of a discussion about the GIS administration service, um, which the council are looking at implementing. So once again, over to you, Nick. Hi everybody, this is Nick Duke from Eagle Technology. I'm joined today by Alan Rochek, who is a senior geospatial consultant and PM at uh, Taupo District Council. Today we're going to talk about um, the GIS Administration Service, which is a service Eagle provide, which is focused on providing um, BAU admin support for a GIS deployment at uh, Taupo District Council uh, on your own infrastructure, on Taupo's infrastructure. Ella, um, can I ask what appealed about the GAS program to you? Of course, yeah. So. Um, we're quite a small team at Topol District Council and we're a very busy GIS team and really the ArcGIS Enterprise stack is not just another application. Um, it does require a specialised and dedicated resource and I think feasibly if we want to achieve our goals as a GIS team, um, we would find it really difficult to also manage our ArcGIS installs and infrastructure effectively. Um, so. Yeah, so there are a few key reasons why the gas agreement um, like appealed specifically to us. And one of the main things was um, it provides a framework for our IT team and Eagle to um, solve problems together directly. Um, and I think that relationship is quite important as often some of the more complex issues, um, they do require that IT input and Eagle input for the, to solve those problems. So it kind of just takes unnecessary load off the, the GIS middleman. Um, and another reason um, I would say that why we like the gas is, I mean, the real value is in the GIS administration aspect. Um, just, it means we don't have to keep up to date ourselves with patching or SSL certificates or, you know, that stuff is all managed and you know, not managed in like an ad hoc way. It's managed with like a proper change con control procedure, for example. And that just means that it just reduces the risk that something will go wrong. Um, I can keep going if you want me to. <laughs> cool. Um, so, and I guess it's just that, that proactive oversight, that reporting and monitoring um, that just ensures that everything is working optimally. Um, and it just means we'll be alerted if something goes wrong and we'll be able to take action. Um, and I guess the reality is we wouldn't have the time to maintain that same level of oversight ourselves because we, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are a busy team with lots of other BAU we have to also um, keep up to date with. Mm -hmm. mm. And, and so you'd, you'd say that it would reduce some overhead on your team. What would you think would be the benefits for the team? And would, would, it, would it be being able to engage more with the business, looking at more um, projects that you might be able to do? Yeah, of course, exactly. I think, um, I mean, the reason why we've gone ahead with, um, I guess, investing in the ArcGIS Enterprise stack is it does provide that 
those tools and capability and that platform to really do some cool stuff. But to build that solid foundation, um, sorry, I've lost it a little bit. <laughs> we have to have that solid foundation first before we can um, actually do interesting things and have that productivity when it comes to delivering projects. Um, and if we, if, as a GAs team, if we can leave the, the support of the system to Eagle and to our excellent IT team, um, it just gives us so much focus to concentrate on real GAs value for our users. Okay, thanks, Ella. Do you see this as an interim step uh, whereby you're still leveraging your own infrastructure? We might see yourselves as an organization moving to the cloud in the future. Definitely. Uh, that's that's the goal. I think there's definitely an understanding within the team that the future is cloud based and um, but it can't just happen in one go for us. So um, this is the perfect stepping stone to get to that position of like a like totally managed infrastructure at some point, which yeah, which will be really great. And do you think with, say, the administrative overhead taken out, do you think that there is a, um, a desire to maybe enable the business to self-service more? In other words, to set up those types of um, workflows or foundational sort of data sets and so forth um, that the users can almost, as I say, self-serve themselves a lot more than they maybe are at the moment? Definitely, and that's the hope. Um, I think with our intention to um, build a local maps product and work that in tandem with um, our portal and RGS Online, um, if we can get users to a point where they can sort of plug and play data in their own maps, um, that, that would be the goal. And not having that kind of GIS administration aspect to deal with, just knowing that things will work straight away without, um, oh, there's a bug, let's go fix it, you know, kind of kind of thing. Um, yeah, that will allow us to just spend more time with users and get them to that point of self-service. Okay, thanks, Ella. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you again, guys. Thanks, Nick and Ella. Um, so hopefully with more time on your hands, we'll, um, you and your GIS team will, will have the ability to get your hands dirty with some GIS tools again. And um, we look forward to seeing your, your new local maps implementation in the future too. So thanks guys. And for our very final presentation of the day, um, last but not least is Orla Hammond from um, Wellington City Council. Uh, and she's part of the city design and place planning team. So uh, without further ado, over to you Orla. Kia ora koutou. My name is Oila Hammond and today I'm going to talk about how my team and I use story maps to engage with the public on our city tomorrow. Before I get into it, a little bit about myself. I'm a GIS analyst in the city design and place planning team here in Wellington City Council. The place planning team works with teams across council to undertake planning and policy research and analysis and provide advice internally and externally regarding the district plan. We are currently publicly engaging on Our City Tomorrow, a draft spatial plan for Wellington City. So what is Our City Tomorrow? The population of Wellington City is expected to grow by 50 to 80,000 people over the next 30 years. These people will need somewhere to live, somewhere to work and somewhere to spend their time. Our City Tomorrow, a draft spatial plan for Wellington City, is a blueprint for how we can ensure that future residents will have more choice in where and how they live, how they move around the city, and how we build a livable and resilient community. Our City Tomorrow kicked off in 2017 when we asked Wellingtonians what their aspirations were for the future of Wellington. Following that consultation, we came up with five goals. The people of Wellington told us they wanted a city that was compact with walkable neighborhoods and good public transport, resilient with a strong community around us and a 
and for recovery, vibrant and prosperous for our unique characters preserved, inclusive and connected, with streets made for walking and cycling and lots of open spaces, and greener for our natural areas of native and indigenous bush in and around the city are protected. In April 2019, we engaged again with Wellingtonians. We asked them, where should we put the 50 to 80,000 additional people? We presented four growth scenarios, inner city focus, suburban center focus, a new greenfield area, or expanding an existing greenfield area. This was the first time our team used a story map in an engagement tool. We presented the four potential growth scenarios and asked the public to make a would you rather type decision to weigh up the implications of each choice. This brings us to the draft spatial plan. The spatial plan sets out the vision for where and how the city will grow over the next 30 years. While it provides the direction for the district plan, which sets the rules and policies for land use, it is a non-statutory document. This is important because it gives us the freedom to be creative and have a little fun with how we present the information. We call it a draft because after we receive feedback from the public, we finalize it before using the plan to inform the district plan review. We had a number of really key goals and objectives that we wanted to achieve with the draft spatial plan. We wanted to make what is usually a long, technical, information-heavy strategy document into something that was interesting and easily digestible. A story map allowed us to break everything down into separate tabs and users could read as much or as little information as they wanted. We wanted the public to be excited and curious about the plan. The story map allowed us to create interactive maps and graphics so users could click through and explore the information instead of reading what could possibly have been a 100-page document. We also wanted the public to engage with us. The end game of this public consultation is to get as much feedback as possible about what the public thinks of the plan that we're proposing for growth in Wellington City. With the digital document, we were able to scatter links to the consultation form throughout to make it easy for users to find out how to submit their feedback. There are a number of key challenges around creating the user experience that we were after with the story map. Some of these included having interactive graphics as well as interactive maps, having material that was engaging for the reader, having levels of information that were flexible, being able to educate new users and accessibility. I'm going to jump over to the story map now so we can see some examples of how we um, approach these challenges. So the story map allowed us to remind our users of previous engagements in a really succinct way. We were able to summarize what we had asked them previously and then summarize the feedback that we received from them. Using a story map like this, users could click through the different scenarios that we had presented to them previously and refresh themselves. However, I also wanted to present the results from the feedback in an interactive way without having to embed another um, piece of technology or include a link to somewhere outside the story map. I wanted to keep everything in one place. To achieve this, I created a spatial graph of sorts where the graphic data was treated like map data in the story map. This meant users could investigate the information without leaving the page. So you can see here, I'm able to click on the different scenarios and the pop-up has given me the information from the feedback of the previous engagement. Making the text interactive using HTML drop-down buttons was another way of adding a fun element to the story map. So we were able to hover over different goals and see a little bit of a description for those goals. 
But these drop down buttons also allowed us to compress large volumes of information. For example, here, where we talk about the different policies and strategies that informed the spatial plan. You're able to hover over a strategy and then read additional information about it in the pop out window. This meant that a user could view very high level information if they wanted, or they could do a deeper dive and read more of the details. On the side here, you can also see where we've used more of these mapped graphics. So I have the goals for our city tomorrow here, and you're able to click them and see what plans, policies, or strategies are contributing to our achieving of these goals. When we were designing the draft spatial plan, we worked off the assumption that the majority of our users had never seen or heard of a story map before. We wanted the public to be able to comfortably use the story map, otherwise there's no point in having it. We performed detailed in-house user testing across a range of staff, from those who would use GIS every day to those who had no idea what it was. We used this feedback to develop little tool tips and hints throughout the document, like I'm highlighting here, to enable all the users to understand what they need to do in order to engage with the document. Another challenge that we needed to overcome was educating people on how to use it. We regularly receive emails and contact from members of the public asking for specific maps that are already available in the draft spatial plan. The first aim of the team was to educate them. So this means teaching the user how to find the information that they're looking for in the story map, instead of immediately just creating additional maps on request, which can be really, really time consuming. Accessibility is of course a big issue when using technology like this, especially in public consultation. We found when story maps were embedded like this, for example, using a map series, and then embedding a map journal within it. It made it really difficult for screen readers to narrate the content of the spatial plan. Because of this, we created a separate story map using the Cascade story map. And here we have the information that's within the draft spatial plan, but we've also included alt text for the maps so that if the user has a screen reader, the screen reader is able to. Um, narrate and describe what the map is showing. For example, here in the central city, we have our map, and then we have our alt text sitting behind that. Finally, sometimes you can't leave the old methods behind. Um, we have PDFs available of all the key maps from the spatial plan on our website, and we bring um, printouts of the maps with us when we're engaging in person. And in case you're wondering what engaging in person looks like, here's a photo of myself and two of my colleagues looking very cold outside Karori Library last week, um, just before the level two lockdown was announced. So what have the results been of using a story map to engage on the draft spatial plan? At the time of recording, we had just over 4,300 views on the draft spatial plan. It's averaging out at about 280 views a day, which is a really good hit number. And currently we have about 72 submissions on the draft spatial plan. So that means 72 people have taken the time to read through the spatial plan and then fill in a form letting us know what they think and what we're proposing. I can't conclude without doing a final plug for the draft spatial plan. So we are still really keen to know what people think. Um, we'd really like for you to look through the story map, have a read through it, see what we're proposing, and then use one of the many links throughout the story map to go on our consultation page where you can fill a really detailed submission in and let us know what you think. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for that, Ola. What an outstanding presentation and um, also just a tremendous use of story maps. You've definitely um, caught my interest in submitting my feedback and I might come and uh, visit you this weekend, I, I believe you, or this week, I believe you're um, out and about the city again. So I'll get some of my colleagues along as well and we'll 
um, come and tell you what we think about your, your draft spatial plan. So thank you for that. Uh, and with that comes the close of our community updates for this year's LG session. Um, but to finish off the session, we'd just like to invite you all to a Q&A to ask some questions on today's content uh, and to get some feedback from you as well. Um, and hopefully, I believe we have quite a few questions waiting for us. Um, just a wee reminder that you can find the questions panel at the bottom uh, left of the NZDUC digital platform there. Um, so if you go there and select LG local government, you'll be able to submit questions. And I'd also like to welcome James and Orla. I believe we've got James on the line, but I know we definitely have Orla here um, to answer some of your questions as well. So welcome guys. Hi, how's it going? Good, thank you. Do we have James there as well? I'm sure James will uh, let us know if he, if he does join us. Um, but just while we've got Orla on the line here, um, we do have a question for you here, Orla. So um, as you mentioned in your presentation, you and your team have been visiting neighborhoods around um, Wellington City, asking for feedback on your draft spatial plan. Um, and I was wondering what the feedback has been so far. How's, uh, what have your responses been like? Um, feedback on a project like this is always going to be mixed. We're going to have all ends of the spectrum from people who really hate it to people who really love it and everything in between. Um, so the idea behind the engagement is that we get to hear all of that feedback because we really do want to know what people think. We want to know if they think everything that we're doing is wrong and terrible for the city or if they think it's a brilliant idea. Um, and the story map has been really helpful for that. Um, it's allowed us to put out as much information as possible without creating, you know, an encyclopedia sized document. And then it gives people more control. So if they're only interested in their suburb, they can just go to their suburb instead of having to flick through hundreds of pages. Um, and feedback on the spatial plan itself has, has been mixed too. Um, primarily positive. Most people are really enjoying it and they're really liking the flexibility and the freedom it's giving them. But then we always do have people who prefer um, hard paper copies. So that's why we still include the maps as PDFs on the website so that we try to tick all the boxes. <laughs> awesome. Are you able to print off that story map as well? I, I, I believe that might be a, a option, but I'm not sure how well it would it would come out. Yeah, because it's um, map journals embedded within the map series, it'd be a bit tricky to print out. Um, we did toy with the idea of creating a full printout version, but we don't really want people printing off loads of paper. So we do have yes. a summary <laughs> version of it that you can print off and that's about 12 pages. But ideally we want everyone to engage online where possible. That's good, forward, forward thinking, yeah. yeah. Um, and just following up from that, do you have any lessons that you've learned from compiling such a sort of uh, a story map with such a wide audience um, and using that as a communication tool? Do you have any, uh, were there any challenges you face, face that you'd, you'd do something differently next time? Hmm. Um, user testing was definitely key with this one. Um, it, you know, when you're trying to decide it, or when you're trying to design something like this, you do want it to be as accessible to as many people as possible. But there are always going to be those little biases where something that I don't consider to be a technical thing um, could be seen as something very technical by someone who's just not used to using the internet or not used to GIS in general. So um, we did have quite an extensive user testing group. We had about 20 people, um, some of whom were really good at technology and would have used story maps every day as part of their jobs. And then some who, you know, just about knew which browser they were using when they were opening something up online. So we got a really, really broad spectrum of users. And that was really helpful because there is a few things that we had initially designed that just weren't going to work for the, the majority of the public. Um, so the, that was a big lesson for us. Definitely thorough user testing is always, always a benefit. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and we do have one audience question for you as well, um, which is what are your plans for the product for when various stages of the plan? Uh, so so when, when the plan sort of moves to the next stage, do you intend on updating that same story map or uh, are there different ways you intend on notifying um, the mm -hmm. public? Yeah, so we haven't... Um haven't gone that far ahead. What we'll probably do is keep the draft spatial plan as is and then create a new version as the, the um, confirmed spatial plan. So 
all of the decisions that we make based off public feedback will have to go towards council or to councillors for approval and we don't want to have um we want to keep a record of what we went to people with and then what we've produced as a result of that um so we'll probably have the draft copy still be there and then the finalized copy available as well yeah and awesome. then the, the district plan will will just be the district plan yeah, awesome. Thanks for that, um, Ola. Uh, and I believe we also have James on the line now. Am I right in saying that, James? Yes, yes. Sorry, I'm, we do. I'm working from home today. So it's, it's a bit quite a right. connect, but all here. But you're here. <laughs> and good thing you are here because we've got a whole plethora of, of questions for you. So I hope you've got your question hat sort of, or answering hat right. ready. <laughs> cool. Um, so we'll start off with. Um, so for James, what department deals with property and dwelling addressing at Christchurch City Council and how many GIS staff do you have compared to the organisation staff total? Are you able to address those, James? Uh, I'll answer the second part of that question first because I think it's easiest. Um, so we have, <laughs> we have one team that's officially called the GIS team. There's 10 people. Um, but we have several other teams that use GIS um, as, as a core competency and as a tool set to help them do what they need to do in their day jobs. We have a monitoring and research team that helps annual planning and performance measuring of the whole organization. So they do a lot of analysis that goes into our community outcome reporting. We have a data management team um, who manage all kinds of different data and no surprise the city council GIS data is a pretty large set of that. Within our asset teams, uh, Three Waters, Parks, Transport, there's also people that use GIS tools um, and in terms of total council staff, so we have about 2,700 full-time staff and in summer we grow up to about 3,700 um, with a lot of library staff and rec centres and so forth. So I think if you add those numbers up, we've probably got about, oh, I would say 20 to 30 full-time people that use GIS as a core competency of theirs, um, but we have 10 GIS people in the GIS team. Um, and in terms of street addressing, property addressing, dwelling addressing, um, that's quite mixed. Our data team handles a lot of that. And I would say they are trying to lead the continuous improvement on a lot of that. But depending on what kind of property and who owns it will um, dictate which part of the council it, it's led by. So we have a facilities team that look after properties that are owned by the council. We have a parks team that look after those that are parks. And then we have those in uh, Three Waters that look after facilities that have things like pump stations on them. So it's pretty fragmented um, and there's no shortage of things that we'd like to improve on. Awesome. Thanks for that, James. I, I didn't realize just how sort of how expensive the Crush It City Council um, sort of organization is as a total, but then also just how many GIS sort of professionals or, or people with key competencies there um, you have. So that's uh, great to know. I've also got one more question here for you, which is, um, can you discuss how your products in brackets content and language align with wider council strategies or messaging? Um, and we've also got things suggested here, such as organizational priorities, public communications and whatnot. Um, is that something so, you want to comment on? Yeah, I can probably start. Um, I would say that we attempt to align based on where the need is greatest. So I wouldn't say that we have a, a fully planned out roadmap of products that align perfectly to serve the organization in their time of need. I mean, we're using sort of concepts and phrases like just in time. So the idea is we want to deliver information or information products and insights that support decision-making just in time. And that's not just the GIS team that spans information management and the BI team as well. Um, but in terms of how those individual products align to essentially our community outcomes, it's very difficult to, to try and sort that out because our community outcomes um, are generally rolling over year on year. And the, the key priorities of the organization um, even though they're pretty similar, um, they do tend to change a little bit. And this particular year is quite challenging with the um, financial implications due to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So I'd say the kinds of things that I'm looking for are where there's a big overlap in geospatial data and we have a lot of data already. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to create or deliver a product where you've got no data. 
we have a lot of asset data, we have a lot of property data, we have a lot of address and rating data. So um, the kinds of products we're trying to deliver are for our three waters and transport teams, for our district planning team, uh, and we're looking at trying to improve the subdivisioning and rates and invoicing and street addressing type processes as well with some products that maybe support internal efficiencies, but also making more of those manual transactions um, done by the area of business that should look after them. So hopefully that sort of tried to address the, the question. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Um, if not, I, I suppose you, people, everyone's got uh, your email address there. So um, if they want to get in touch further, um, hopefully you can supply some answers there too. Thank you. Um, and one thing I didn't mention is for our presenters that aren't here today, um, yeah, the email addresses are up on screen at the moment. So um, if you would like to get in touch with them, uh, feel free to do so, or uh, we can get you in touch with them also. Um, I think just in the essence of time, we might close the Q&A there. Um, but thank you, James and Ola, for, um, for joining us uh, for that very brief Q&A. But we really appreciate your time today. No problem. Um, it's a pleasure. That's all good. Thank you. Um, so just a few little closing statements, um, which I'm sure you heard in this morning's session as well. But um, everything you've seen today, all the content videos and sessions will be available on the NZUC digital platform for the next two weeks. Uh, you can continue to ask us and our presenters questions on there as well. Um, and they'll be passed on to the right person. And apologies if we didn't get to answer your question today, but we'll make sure that we do address it. Uh, and also, if you did take notes within the uh, digital platform as well, please do um, remember to send those to yourself. And very last of all, just thank you very much to everyone out there watching today. Um, thank you to our outstanding community presenters and all the hard work that you've put into um, providing us with a, a story and, and I hope everyone's found that valuable. Um, thank you to our sponsor, Nearmap. Um, I definitely found that video that they um, supplied uh, really engaging. Uh, and also thank you to our AV guy in the, in the background here, Glenn, who's been working on those transitions to make everything run smoothly today. So thank you, Glenn. Uh, so last of all, wishing you all a happy and healthy remainder of the year. And we look forward to seeing you at the 2021 New Zealand ESRI User Conference. Kakite ano, see you soon, everyone. Cheers. Well done, okay, we are off. Uh, <laughs> <woo>. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good work. I'm sorry the Q&A was so brief. But, uh, I, I think I am kind of budgeted enough time. But <laughs> at least we got a few questions in there. Well done, folks. Thanks very much. Yeah, and thanks, James and Orla, for joining us. I really appreciate that. And for all your hard work with the videos as well. You guys are <laughs> superstars, There's spatial no champions. <laughs> Thank, thanks for hosting them. No, we'll that's quite all right. Really appreciate it. Yes, Thank for you. sure. Uh, Ola, are you, are you coming along to the Thursday ESP event by chance? Oh, I might have to put you some time for it, potentially. Okay. I may have forgotten. Still recovering yeah. from a week of skiing. <laughs> fair, enough, fair enough. It does take a bit of recovery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, cheers, thanks for that. And sure, I'll talk to you again. Sounds good. Thank you again and enjoy your evening. You too. Have a good week. You too. Bye. Take care. Bye. And not sure if you're still there, James, but yeah, thank you to you as well. And thank you to Alice in the background feeding me questions. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks, Nick. Same to you. Another one down. Yeah. Until yeah. next year. <laughs> See ya. And thanks, Glenn. Everything seemed to go really smoothly there. So appreciate yep. all your hard work and, and oh, yeah. thank you. Yep. Awesome. All right. Okay. I'll uh, end this meeting now. So sounds good. Thank you. See you next Bye. year, perhaps. Hopefully, Bye. hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah. We'll see how we next year. Hopefully, hopefully everything's good in next year. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how we go. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Catch ya. Bye.